Specializing in the finest assortment of oboes, clarinets, bassoons, and their accessories, RDG Woodwinds serves musicians from around the world. Their employees are all professional musicians who have a deep knowledge of the products they sell. RDG's repair shop has an international reputation with a combined 100 plus years of experience among the five repair technicians. Plain and simple, RDG provides excellent products and fabulous customer service. Visit them at rdgwoodwinds.com. They look forward to working with you. Chemical City Double Reeds is a full-service double reed shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Reed Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Reed Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Our next episode, June 15th, will feature a discussion of what we as artists can and are doing during these troubling times, a topic we are intentionally delaying until then to give us time to research it thoughtfully. In sensitivity and reverence to the serious nature of recent events, and in solidarity with our Black listeners, we have decided not to include a dish in today's episode. Please enjoy this interview with Barrick Stees. This episode is brought to you in part by Barton Kane, revolutionizing gouged, shaped, and profiled bassoon cane with precision, consistency, and love since 2012. Leave the cane processing to us. Free up time to practice, take a romantic dinner cruise, or cuddle on the couch with your cat on a rainy day and listen to Double Read Dish. Enter coupon code Double Read Dish Rocks My World, no spaces, for free shipping on your next Barton Kane order. That's www.bartonkane.com. Edmund Nielsen Woodwinds has been serving the Double Reed community for 70 years. Nielsen sells a wide variety of oboe, oboe de more, English horn, bassoon, and contrabassoon reeds and cane, as well as reed making accessories, reed cases, and lafrex. And of course, they have the classic Nielsen wedge knife, which features a double hollow ground with a choice of handle size. In addition, they have many other knives available. Nielsen has long been known for their large Heckle Bassoon Bocal Inventory. Fill out their online trial form to find the perfect Heckle Bocal for you. For all your double reed accessory needs, Nielsen is ready to help you. We are absolutely excited and delighted to welcome Barry Stees, Assistant Principal Bassoon of the Cleveland Orchestra and Instructor of Bassoon at the Cleveland Institute of Music to the podcast. Welcome, Barry. Thanks. Great to be with you, too. I'd love to find out how you came to the bassoon. Okay, well, it's a specific story. Both my parents were amateur musicians, uh, and my mother played the uh, bass. And um, when I was in the, uh, I think it was the fifth grade, she took me to uh, an orchestra rehearsal. She played in the local uh, community orchestra. And I was able to sit next to her, and there was this long wooden instrument with a bunch of shiny keys on it right in front of me. And um, I'd never seen it before, and it made an interesting sound. And so... Um, Later, um, I don't know how much later, but uh, we had our um, hearing test and the, and the, you know, aptitude test that they, I don't know if they still do it, but they used to test uh, anyone who was interested in uh, band instruments. And um, the, the band director um, said after the test that I could play whatever I, I felt like, but he really wanted to, me to play the euphonium because they really needed euphonium players. And I said, no, I I really like to play the bassoon. I thought that would be an interesting challenge. And so um, 
fortunately, he let me do it. So I actually started on the bassoon. I'd had a, you know, sort of a year of very beginning piano before that. But I, I think that's a little unusual. Most people start on the clarinet or, the, you know, flute or something or saxophone or whatever. So can you talk to us about your training and educational journey and how you came to be serious about the bassoon and want to pursue it as a career path? Well, the, be- the biggest influence I had early on were my, uh, my parents and grandparents who were very supportive and uh, uh, classical music was very important to them. And they were um, all, I have uh, three siblings and we all played an instrument and the piano uh, and lessons were required. Um, and we all had varying degrees of interest and, and compliance with that, of course. Um, uh, but I followed through on it. And um, probably um, early um, support and influence uh, came from um, uh, four summers at the Interlochen Arts Camp, uh, where my teacher was E. Sanford Berry, who used to teach at the University of Illinois. And uh, <clears throat> during the, my high school years, I studied with Wilbur Simpson, who was the second bassoonist in the Chicago Symphony. And uh, he, was, he was a wonderful teacher for me. Um, and that set me up well for, for college auditions. Um, I, um, I, 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 uh, got a full scholarship to Peabody Conservatory <clears throat> by auditioning at Interlochen. And, and I went there and Phil Colker was the teacher there. And I had a little lesson with him, check it out. And he said, uh, he said to me, well, I see you're, um, going up to Rochester to, to, uh, play for David Van Hoosen, uh, and um, I just want to let you know that um, if you get into Eastman and you decide to go there, um, it won't, won't uh, be any skin off my back because uh, that was my teacher, too. And um, I went up there um, in the middle of the winter, went up by myself, um, and um, uh, it wasn't an audition day, and so it was just a normal business day at Eastman. I went in and... Uh, I got this really long uh, bassoon lesson where as I was just expecting to, um, you know, play, play my audition material and have a few comments and shake hands and leave. And uh, it was a really, really amazing lesson. And I thought, Hey, here's, here's something really, really special going on here. And it's turned out to be the case because I don't know uh, if people are aware of who is, in school with me at the time there, but we had uh, Judy LeClaire, we had Felicia Foland in the St. Louis Symphony, Betsy Sturdivant in um, the Columbus Symphony, Jonathan Sherwin, my colleague in the bassoon section here, and I'm probably forgetting, oh, George Sakakini, just a number of of leading lights in the bassoon world were there, so the peer group was was amazing, and and of course my instruction was exemplary. He, He was probably the best teacher I had in any subject anywhere, anytime. So I, I was very fortunate. And um, it engendered in me a, a real uh, uh, desire to pass on what I've learned. So I love people that know me know that I'm a very dedicated teacher. And uh, I feel like it's a very important thing to pass on what you, you've been given. So I really... Uh, I really feel like a, a, that, that's a duty that I have because I was given so much. When we have guests who've studied with these legacy teachers, we always, who will, we won't have the chance to interview. We always like to ask them about uh, what they were like. So I'd, I'd love to hear more about Mr. Van Hoosen and what your lessons with him were like and, and that type of thing. It was a very um, comfortable, nurturing environment. Um, he um, he, had a, he was a soft-spoken man, um, but but very um, to the point of what he had to say. I we always uh, traded stories about our lessons afterwards, like in the cafeteria or whatever. And I got the impression I later observed lessons that he gave. I never did that while I was in school, but he he uh, actually was a, a rather different teacher for each student. He was remarkably gifted at adjusting his pedagogy for the job at hand. 
which I don't think a lot of teachers can do. He was not a cookie cutter teacher. He did not have outside of the, um, you know, bread and butter, uh, Milda concert study and a few of the big solo pieces and excerpts. He did not have a uh, strict regimen of, of uh, materials that, that you had to get through. In fact, um, it was much more, you know, what did you bring to play today and work with that. Um, the uh, studio itself was was a, a warm environment. Um, he always had a pot of coffee in the studio, so there was a smell of coffee during your lesson, which I think just having that going kind of made me concentrate a little better. I don't know if that really is true <laughs> or not, but... But um, I later, and I tried to do this in, in my teaching when I first started, I always had some coffee in there. And, and what I didn't discover was that he um, was a Sanka drinker. And so it was this awful instant stuff that he was drinking and it was decaffeinated. And I, I was, I was drinking the high test stuff and, and I, you know, I was ruining my stomach for teaching because I thought I had to be like him. It was really funny. Uh, so I stopped, I stopped doing that. But, um, but I don't know, he, he had the, that decaf going, and it was very relaxing. The only unnerving thing in the studio, and we all learned not to look at it, was that there was this big 12-window strobe tuner, the old-fashioned one with the calling all cars microphone on it, and the windows on, and the strobes going. And if you looked over there, you could see how bad your intonation was. It was really <laughs> humbling. And and he could look over there at will and tell you something was not in tune. And, and I, as I said, we, we all learn not to look over there. Just don't look. Um, because it was, you know, invariably humbling. Um, he, he um, one, I think one of the, the few drawbacks in his teaching, if there could be said to be any, uh, was that he did not play much in lessons. When he did, it was, it was, uh, truly amazing and I remember getting you know a lump in my throat and tearing up a bit sometimes because it was so beautiful but he had a he had a real issue playing with students he always said they played out of tune and made him play out of tune so he was a little um a little spoiled and and didn't play much and I we all wish that he had I think played more uh, so we didn't get to hear that that sound and that approach but when he did um he had this um, really big upper body. Like, it looked like he was wearing, um, you know, a, a catcher's protective gear or an umpire's shield because he had this big, broad chest, and he would, he would sit up erect and play. And it was, it was an, an unbelievable physical, visual example of how to support your body and how to play with really good breath support and, and – um, I think, I think, for instance, if you look at Judy LeClaire when she plays, she does that too. She doesn't, of course, have the big upper body. And she's got really great uh, posture, and I, I try to do that myself. But um, the people that picked up on visual cues uh, from him developed that way of playing, and it was really helpful. So, yeah, I mean, there are so many other stories. I could say that, you know, he had an armchair with one of the, um, one of the arms cut off, he cut it off with a hacksaw so he could pull the tune and wheel himself around in the chair. <laughs> right? <laughs> um, there were some other weird things in there. Um, he had um, he discovered that the piano tuners like to stretch the intonation on the piano because it made the upper register sound good. Do you know this? If, if, uh, if no. the things are turned, tuned down a little bit, it makes the high notes on the piano resonate a little more. And, of course, the bassoon is sharp in the low register, and so it made us all sound terrible. And so he would he would have the tuner not spread the intonation, so we would sound better. Um, yeah. So he, he he was always trying to figure out little things to to uh, you know to customize. He was a he was a, a fiddler and and liked to tinker with things. Uh, I he was he was a kind teacher, and for for students that did not need to be, you know, really strongly managed or reprimanded, that worked really well. Um, and I was, I never had a, I never had 
a rough teacher. I never had a teacher that scolded me or was very tough on me. And so when a teacher did say something in a firm tone, it really struck home with me. I remember one lesson I had with him where my, my reads were terrible and I knew it and I didn't sound good. He didn't say a thing until the end of the lesson. I was, I was getting up to leave and the door was open and I was about to get out the door and he said, come back next week with some better reads. Okay. And I was just totally blown. I mean, just totally devastated. Just little things like that really, uh, you know, for me that, that was what I needed. And uh, the other thing I remember about him, which I try to do is I I stay in uh, close touch with my graduates, with students that are graduating. They come back to me, I've got students that are in touch with me, you know, 20 years after they work with me, asking me advice and so on, or coming and playing for me. I really think that the, that relationship, if it's a good one, goes on and, and on. And in fact, um, Jonathan Sherwin and I um, played for him in his retirement community, probably within a couple months of his dying, we came and played duets. And, um, you know, I think that was really, really a, a, a big deal for him to hear students in that, in that setting. Some of the Carnegie Mellon students would go in and play. He was in Pittsburgh at the time. So um, that was a, a relationship that started, um, you know, in the 70s and continued until uh, uh, his death just a few years ago. Could you walk us through uh, what happened after graduation and how you came to your current position? Yeah, my career path is interesting, I think. I'm not one of those people that graduated uh, fully formed and went right into a big orchestra. I've done just about any, everything there is to do in, my, in, 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 in a career on bassoon. I was fortunate after graduating to win a position in the Savannah Symphony, uh, as principal bassoon there for one year. Uh, I did not go to graduate school. I quit after a year. There were a lot of people leaving. It was a very low-paid job, and there was a lot of sitting around. Um, it was a beautiful city to live in, and we played some nice music. But it was, um, I was I'm from the Chicago area, and I I caught wind of some opportunities there, and so I went back to Chicago and uh, got married and uh, f- tried to freelance for three years and never did it full-time. It was never, not successful. I worked in a record store full-time for a couple of those years. Uh, so I know what it's like. I've got a few students in the area now that have just graduated and they're trying to get their, their feet on the ground professionally. And it's, that's a very tough uh, period of time, maybe the toughest time in a, in a young musician's life um, to actually get yourself into a solid career. So I've done that. I can advise people on that. I know how it feels. Um, I'm not one of those, um, you know, um, privileged orchestra players who's been doing it for 40 years with a, you know, a guaranteed source of income and uh, benefits and so on. And uh, shortly after that, I, I won a couple positions conducted by the same conductor in uh, Indiana and Central Illinois. I played in those orchestras for a couple of years while still living in Chicago. Then, uh, then I won a principal bassoon job in the Hartford Symphony. I played there for for uh, four years, and um, we had major um, labor troubles there one year. And I could sort of see the handwriting on the wall, and. Um, uh, I, um, we had just bought a house and, and Melinda was pregnant with our first daughter and things were looking really bad, uh, for both of our jobs. And so, um, I interviewed for the uh, teaching position at Michigan state and was hired and I, um, established myself there, um, as a teacher, I started with one bassoon major and built the studio up to, you know, maybe as high as 14 or 15 majors over a period of time. Got tenure, was about to be promoted to full professor and uh, won the, uh, the Cleveland Orchestra job after being at MSU for 11 years. And so, yeah, so, and that that is a career path that I just described to you that was how long? Uh, 20 years, 25 years, you know, where I did all kinds of things. In Chicago, I played, I played jingles. I played TV commercials. I played uh, in um, 
I played for some of the shows coming in the area. I played uh, in, in Hartford. I played in a professional wooden quintet outside of the orchestra. In Hartford, we played ballet, opera, chamber music, quintet, full symphony, pops. I, I've done everything there is to do pretty much on the bassoon in the, in the classical field. So um, I don't think many of my uh, Cleveland Orchestra colleagues can, can boast of that wide range of experience. It's kind of unusual. Um, I, and I have to say, I do feel blessed, but I also feel like I really did earn um, my way all the way through. So I've, I've worked hard and, and uh, I've, I, um, I, I don't have any qualms about saying that I have lost probably 70 to 80 auditions and stopped counting after that. I had to learn how to audition and uh, made a lot of mistakes. Well, that, that leads really well to my follow-up, which is um, Galit and I are both full-time in higher ed. And I, I think about the, the daily reality of what you have on your plate as a professor. And then I think about what I would even anticipate as the reality of preparing for auditions and especially auditions in such substantive orchestras and doing those simultaneously you know a lot of times there's this narrative that in this country we either do one or the other you're either on the higher ed track or you're on the orchestral track and so I'd love to know about your preparation and then also your mindset was it a specific intention to move to the orchestral realm or were, was it just pursuing opportunities I, I know that's a big question but well, I'll tell my Cleveland Orchestra audition story first because it's a, it's actually a very interesting story. See, I think I was 42 when the opening came up. And, you know, um, I think everybody knows that in your 40s, you just don't audition very well, generally speaking. I mean, you really don't. Um, auditioning is a young person's game. Uh, 20-something, even 30-something, you know, it's easier mentally and, and physically, I think. Um and so I, I realized I was getting kind of long in the tooth in the audition game, you know. And, but the Cleveland Orchestra was the orchestra that Van Hoosen had us all listen to because he played in it in the 1950s and uh, always held it up as the, uh, the ideal of, of American orchestras. That was his, his um, you know, the, the, Zell, the Zell recordings and everything. Uh, that was his model. So we all listened to that stuff and tried to learn from it. And so when this opening came up, you know, these things don't come up very often. I mean, this is a once in a career opening. And I thought, well, okay, you know, and I, I at the time was feeling not, not good about how I was demonstrating excerpts in the lessons. And my motivation for this, believe it or not, probably for the first time in my career was, let's go take this audition so that I can demonstrate these excerpts better when I come back. That was mainly it. And so I went and um, I drew number one and I played and my thought was, okay, you know, um, Cleveland's or uh, East Lansing is, uh, you know, four hours away. I can be home for lunch. So I played and, um, and they said, uh, yeah, well, stick around. Why don't you play again? I thought, wow, what happened there? And so I played in the, the second round. I played number one again, drew number one. And um, I think it was just two rounds that day. I could be wrong. I can't remember. <clears throat> At the end of the day, they couldn't reach a decision. Uh, some people they were interested in hearing um, didn't show. And uh, for whatever reason, the music director couldn't make up his mind uh, from Duck 90. And uh, so um, they said, well, we're not going to hire anybody today. And then the personnel manager pulled me aside and said, um, you know, um, we're interested in you. Uh, we're going to do this again sometime real soon. Um, let's, let's stay in touch. And that was about as concrete as it was. Uh, so I think it was five months later in May, four months later, um, they had an invitation only audition. I think there were maybe 10 or 12 of us came back and uh, we played three rounds and I drew first each time. So going first is not a disadvantage necessarily. Everybody thinks it is, but it doesn't have to be. And they narrowed it down to two of us. And at the end of that day, again, um, 
uh, Doc Nani could not decide what to do, did not feel strongly in either way, but there were two of us and they said, well, um, all right, uh, we're going to have you come back and each play a week in the orchestra, which is unusual. We don't do that uh, in Cleveland very often. And the problem was then he wasn't going to be back conducting us until September. So we had to go the whole summer uh, waiting on this decision. And of course, my colleagues in MSU were intensely interested in what's going on. Of course, <laughs> you can't keep any of that secret. And so, Was that an understatement? Yeah. And so like I couldn't, <laughs> and my students too, you know, it was, it was pretty hard to keep all that under your hat. Anyway, so uh, we go we go to uh, September and they they designate the uh, the work week. Well, my first rehearsal with the orchestra was Tuesday, September eleventh, two thousand one, and so we got into the uh, the players' uh, locker room and it was you know normal day people getting back to work first day back at work from vacation right. Mahler fifth was the first piece being rehearsed. Walked by a TV set and there was a, you know, some smoke in a building, right? And uh, you know, we'd heard something about a small plane hitting uh, one of the one of the towers. We got up on stage, and everybody's warming up. I'm taking it in. I'm I'm trying to you know hit a home run. And um, the executive director got on the podium and said. Um, you know, uh, there's been a national tragedy. We're canceling the rehearsals today and sending everyone home so you can contact people in New York. And so um, they canceled those rehearsals. And uh, the piece I was playing principal bassoon on involved a singer whose plane was grounded. You might recall it. People weren't flying for a while after that. And so the, the piece on which I was really going to be examined was canceled, was taken off the program. So Mahler Fifth has a, an independent third bassoon part in a couple of the movements, but there really isn't a lot for the third bassoon to do. And so I was very concerned that I wouldn't be heard and judged you know, appropriately. And as it turned out, so was the committee. Uh, the program had been chopped down to just Mahler Fifth. And so we went through the rehearsals, and I played rehearsed third bassoon. Played Thursday night. After Thursday night, uh, personnel manager came up to me and said, um, "We need to hear you uh, more." And so we would like you to play principal bassoon in the performance Friday night. No rehearsal. And so they moved me into the principal chair for Friday night. Started the piece. And these two eyes of Christoph von Dachmanni were on me the whole way through. He was very nervous. I was going to screw up the performance, I think. Uh, and until the third movement where he started looking elsewhere. For some reason, I had calmed him down or something. Um, got done with that. Um, that was my my real trial. And then uh, Saturday night, I went back in the third bassoon chair, and then they sent me home, and the next week, the other person they were looking at came and played. And a uh, phone call came about a week later offering me a position. So that's how I got the job. It took three times, three auditions, and the third audition happened during a, a, a really terrible week for the country. Um, so it's so super dramatic. You asked about the... Uh, how one how one balances both um, teaching career and playing career, and uh, that's that's very difficult. And uh, all I'll say is that while I was teaching in East Lansing, I was very concerned about my playing going off a deep end or going off into some bizarre corner. Because, let's face it, teachers who primarily teach and don't have a big orchestra to play in regularly can put a mediocre read on their vocal and probably sound better than most of their students. You know, you can go days without practicing and maybe sound better than most of your students and demonstrate effectively. Um, I was worried about, I just didn't want to become, I mean, I'd heard, I'd been to double read conferences and I'd heard, you know, some, some players who are mainly teachers 
and some players too, there were mainly players who I thought had adopted very bizarre ways of playing and some terrible habits. And I'm a big one for learning from negative example. For me, it's don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. Um, you know, I can, that to me, that's very easy to see. So I, I was, I was really concerned about sticking with my fundamentals, um, making more reads than I needed, um, manufacturing numerous playing opportunities, sending my resume around to area orchestras to play. And I was playing third bassoon and contra bassoon in the Grand Rapids Symphony pretty regularly. Um, played in the Detroit Symphony once my whole time there, but that was um, uh, just because they had, they had good subs they used all the time. But anyway, so I was very concerned about, about going off the deep end with my playing, and I, I looked for opportunities to, to um, play with others and recorded myself off and those sorts of things. You know, teaching, actually teaching, if you do it right, you're teaching students improve your playing because you have, to, you have to teach fundamentals, and as you teach fundamentals, you discover ways to teach yourself. Ideally, I think that's what happens. I would love to know about your experience auditioning and how you managed your expectations and your mindset going through these really high pressure situations. Um, You know, it seems like you've done it with the safety net of a job and without the safety net of a job. So talk to us a little bit about how you manage your mind in those, uh, in those circumstances? Well, that was something I really had to learn how to do. I, 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 I was, uh, I, when I was young, um, I'm still this way kind of, when I was young, I was very stubborn. I really believed in myself and it was really hard for me to accept failure. Um, I had a lot of anger. Um, I, I, I remember just being furious at the end of auditions, wondering why they, either didn't choose me or didn't advance me even, you know, had a lot of of trouble dealing with that. But ultimately, I think ultimately I was able to come to the conclusion that in spite of, you know, rumors or ideas that the audition was fixed or the audition was somehow not fair, that was something I could not control. And I had chosen to take the audition. And so what I could get from it was what I had control over. And what I had control over was my own playing and my, and my, uh, my advancement as far as, as far as building my playing. So it took a lot of work mentally, but I think what I did a lot of times was to be able to turn it around and say, well, what am I playing needs work instead of saying, well, why don't they like me? Um, and so I, I was able to turn it back onto that. And, you know, for instance, um, I never liked my double tongue, and that would be something that I would point to today that could use some more work. You know, stuff like that, just to make yourself um, so invincible that, you know, there, there would be no place to criticize you, that sort of thing. Um, and that was especially helpful when I didn't have work and I have a super supportive wife who uh, loves me and was very understanding of these things, um, moved around with me and all the ups and downs of my career and so on. So I had that. That was a very, that's a, a wonderful thing. We've kind of been discussing your journey in auditioning. And uh, we've often heard from guests that they learn as much, if not more, after they're hired and they're a part of hiring committees and being on the other side of the screen. Um, Can you talk to us about your experience in listening to auditions? I I know you um, have written about this in the past and um, maybe advice for people who are still on that path of pursuing an orchestral position, your experience on the other side of the screen. Yeah, it's true. That it's true. You do learn a lot from being on the other side because you just you just hear the raw examples of of what people do. It's not really possible while you're playing an audition to have an objective view of how you're coming across. Nerves are involved. 
you're in a new environment, um, you're doing the most difficult things ever written for your instrument in rapid fire succession, you can't really tell how you come across, no matter how uh, perceptive you think you are. So being on the other side of that is, is very instructive. Um, also, being on a committee is part of the mix, and you do see how um, committees work together or don't work together. That, that can be uh, interesting to know, too. And there's also the dynamic of having, in, at least in America, the music director there. In our auditions, the music director is present, um, except in percussion auditions for the, the, in the preliminary rounds. We screen our auditions down. We, we're on the, on the other end of the spectrum from the Chicago Symphony, who will you know, invite anybody to play. That's their way. Um, we, screen, we screen tapes and resumes and invite, you know, maybe 50 or 60 people to an audition. I don't know. I haven't sat on a committee recently to know whether that's changed much or not. So the music director's in there, and that's also a dynamic that, of course, can be, can be um, difficult to navigate because uh, the committee is just advisory we're not making a hot, we're not hiring anybody. We're just advising that music director to um, give him or her, um, you know, our best opinion on, on uh, who should, who should be hired. And that person can either follow your advice or not. So it's difficult, but um, as a, as an individual committee member listening, you know, of course it all comes back to really good, control of fundamentals, um, pulse, intonation, accuracy, as much as I hate to admit it, does play a role, um, you know, rhythm, understanding the style of the music you're playing. I will say that what I was told that distinguished me from other players in, in my orchestra auditions in, in numerous occasions was that I was able to um, somehow, I don't know, how to say this right, but I was able to play in the style of the composer or at least make, you know, a, a Mozart excerpt sound different stylistically from a Strauss excerpt or something like that, you know. So those are, those are things that you pick up on. Also, maybe the biggest thing is um, winning uh, candidates are ones that make um, playing the instrument sound easy. You know, they're able to somehow mask the difficulties that they actually experience. We know they're having trouble doing something. We know it's hard for them, but the way it comes across is easy. And that, by that, I would say they're also not pressing the sound of the instrument. They're not straining. They're not trying to create um, a huge dramatic presence and, and at, at the expense of a beautiful sound or at the expense of of easy technique or so on. And, and you can say right or wrong whether that's, that's a likable characteristic or not. It may, it may tend to end up with kind of bland um, uh, players with small sounds being hired. I've seen that happen. But it is a winning quality to, to have somebody in your group, to hire somebody for your group, who seems to have an ease about playing the instrument and isn't straining since we're on the subject of listening to auditions, what can you tell us about listening to your student auditions? You know, young people who are, you probably get a ton of young people auditioning to be in your studio. And what do you look for that indicates that this is a student that you want to admit? Yeah, there's some qualities to, to uh, talk about there for sure. Um, at CIM, we have um, our auditions structured in a way where we allow time for us to work with the individual uh, student who's auditioning. So um, John Clauser and I teach at CIM, and uh, you know, for the first half of the audition, the student will play their material, and then uh, both of us actually, with each student, will take some time to work on things with them. And for me, that is the most important, most revealing characteristic, how a student responds to a new teacher uh, giving them instructions to make changes in their playing on the spot, because that is, a, that is the most important characteristic in playing in an orchestra. No one, 
you got 100 people on stage, no one is going to wait around for you to try things two and three times to get the right idea. That really is a waste of time. And those people get weeded out pretty fast. And that is not something you can, like, you can probably improve on it, but you have to have a certain knack already built in. So for me, that's even more important than, than, um, raw talent, I think. I'll give you an example, and I won't mention names, but we had a, we had a, a person audition this year who played, uh, I won't even mention the concerto, but played a concerto that's extremely technically difficult, and she did a wonderful job with it. But then when we worked with that person, it was really hard for her to change anything she did, really hard. And in spite of the fact that she played a nearly flawless performance of, of the you know, first movement of that piece, um, it was a little bit of a negative. You know, I'd, I actually would rather see someone come in and play, you know, something rather simple, um, even maybe like the Talman Sonata, two movements of the Talman Sonata, and do something really inventive with it. And then when we break it down and ask them to do a few things differently, uh, really come alive and kind of change their playing in a big way. That is really impressive to me. So for me, that's a big deal. Um, when they have a private lesson or a guest lesson with me, I always check, uh, I always check their articulation speed. <clears throat> uh, and I also check to see if there's kind of a, a, a Bermuda triangle of, of articulation speeds in there between the, the fast reflex tongue that many people have and then the uh, tongue that requires individual effort. Um, what I'm talking about often occurs between about, if you're tonguing 16, it's between 100 on the metronome and, and you know, 116. Somewhere in there, a lot of people, well, not a lot of people, but some students have uh, a stutter in, at that speed. Um, they can go faster very easily. Um, there's a reflex in there, but they haven't trained in that, in that zone. And sometimes... Sometimes that never goes away. Sometimes that's, that's a, a real problem. So I always check for that. And I check their, you know, their capacity, if they can tongue really fast for me, that's a, that's a plus. I think you can teach that uh, to a certain extent, but I also think there's a physical limitation there that's hard to get around. And double tonguing is, is always something they have to learn, of course. But um, I don't know. Maybe I can name two or three bassoonists whose double tongue sounds identical to their single tongue. Most people, you can tell what they're doing, and I don't find it attractive. It's necessary, but I don't think it sounds as good as a good single tongue. So that's a problem if, if there's the stutter and if the speed is low. Um, I check their hearing a little bit. I'll play notes on the piano to tell them what note it is. Mostly it's relative hearing, not, not perfect pitch. Usually that doesn't bring up problems, but sometimes there, there is somebody who's really not, not tuned in there. Um, degree of interest, of course, I mean, it's a major, a major relationship, the, the student teacher relationship, if they, if they seem to be just window shopping, then okay, that's fine. I'm not that interested in you then. Um, can't always tell that. If they're interesting to talk to, if they have um, other interests, I think that's, that's a sign of an active mind. Um, you know, if they're good at asking questions, if they ask questions, a lot of students are afraid to ask questions. I, I, I love uh, answering questions. So those are, those are qualities I look for. You are um, exceptionally thoughtful about your read making process. Um, you even construct read tools and, and that type of thing. And there's a wealth of information available at your blog, which we will link to in the show notes. Oh, good so much more than we could get into, but I'd love to hear about um, maybe how you developed this approach and kind of your mindset in read making. And if there's any advice that you would be inclined to give us and our listeners. Well, very little of what I know about reads is my own original thinking. Um, I, I um, maybe to mention just one other thing about David Van Husen that wasn't exactly a high priority with him was teaching um, very, very methodical um, follow-up, especially on read making. He was a great read maker, and he knew how to fix reads, and he would help you, but you had to prod him 
and so he wouldn't he he wasn't um, you know a real methodical uh, teacher with reads. Had a interesting sort of uh, backhanded uh, positive side to that though because he was a genius and I've never known any other teacher at getting you to physically address a read in a way that made it sound its best. I don't know of anybody else. There are a lot of people that just, you know, teach, put your lips on the read, blow, and you're pretty much good to go. You know, there's a lot of that. He really understood how to manipulate your face, um, your oral cavity, your tongue, all of those things, and could teach you to do that. And so I actually, I'm actually pretty good at playing on bad reads. And for me, that was a, that was a drawback in my early young professional age because I, I didn't have a high standard for my remaking and I could have, I could have advanced faster, I think, but I, I also knew that I could squeeze by. <laughs> so, but, but about me and my read making. So uh, some of the things are things I learned from Van Hoosen, you know, a lot of the dimensions, especially the scrape dimensions, thickness of the blade and so on. Uh, the shape is something I, I found on my own. Um, a lot of uh, Hertzberg's things I stole. I don't don't uh, claim him as a teacher because I never studied with him, but a lot of his students were very generous with me, showing me things. I've uh, communicated and read Jean-Marie Heinrich's uh, treatises on, on cane and, and reed making and learned a lot about the basics of reeds, how they work from him. And... Um, Mostly just just uh, picking the brains of other people and trying things for me was 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 really helpful. My my interest in the mechanical side of of, of read tools and read making came partly from my relationships with uh, various repair technicians and watching them work on bassoons and kind of knowing kind of finding that more interesting than um, <clears throat> actually what they were doing to the bassoon, but seeing how they were using the machines and. Uh, Ken Potzik, who's a repair technician in Atlanta, was, uh, is my, my go-to guy for ideas about machining and, and so on. So that's become a real hobby of mine, actually. Not not just making the uh tools, but just fooling around in the basement and making stuff. I just made a, uh, a pre-gouger and a, and a guillotine for, for uh, the CIM students to use uh, while I'm in, you know, this uh, uh, shelter-at-home stuff. So that's been coming along. Any plans on making any oboe read tools? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I can't help with that. <laughs> Would you share with us a favorite memory of a past performance? Well, I'm a big Wagner fan. I've always loved Wagner operas and, and have not played that many. Um, but one of my first, in my, in my first season with Cleveland, uh, we played a uh, semi-staged version of, of Siegfried with uh, Christoph von Dachny and, Dachny and a really good international cast. And for me, that was just, I mean, the whole first season with an orchestra like that is is a real joy and just a thrill. Every time you do something, when you get into an orchestra like that um, for the first time, it's it's amazing. It's like you've never played a Beethoven symphony until you've played it with an orchestra like that. And so for me, a lot of those first performances of things were really really thrilling but that that one for me was <clears throat> was exciting you know it was a big long opera and we don't do that you know we envy our we, we're, we're actually sort of not envious of our, our colleagues in the Met because they work so hard and but um, you know our canteen was open with full dinner service and everything and that never happens you're just all this people walking around in costumes and it was it was a lot of fun so for me, that was a that was a highlight, you know, recording some of the Bruckner symphonies in the uh, church where Bruckner played the organ to really understand the reason why Bruckner symphonies are the way they are with all the silences. You know, if you play in a, a marble-filled cathedral, you need a few seconds for all that sound to dissipate before you move on. You know, that, that was exciting. We, we may do that again. I don't know. But um, some of the tours have been fun. I remember going to rehearsal on a boat in Lucerne because the streets were flooded and our hotel was across the lake from from the uh, performing auditorium. So they charted a boat for us. Yeah, 
I think that Siegfried stands out. Um, there have been so many others, but um, for me, that was a, a really big deal. What advice do you have for a young musician who aspires to have a career like yours? The uh, old um, oboe teacher at Eastman, Robert Sprinkle, used to say, if there's anything else you can do, do it. And this was back in the 1970s. And, you know, things haven't changed that much. If you can't do anything else and really need to do this, um, then you're probably in the right place. If you have questions, you know, consider those questions seriously and see if something else, you know, looks looks attractive to you. I, I hate to sound negative, but, you know, in light of current situations, it's not going to get better, I think. It's probably just going to get worse as far as the... Um, you know, the, the job market. Um, it's a, it's a worthy profession. Um, if you don't care about, um, living too comfortably and, and really, really are willing to make some sacrifices, it can be quite rewarding. Um, try to be versatile and roll with the punches. There are many ways to make a living playing the double reads. Um, doesn't have to be playing in a symphony orchestra. Um, there are a lot of younger players now that are really charting some exciting paths uh, with alternative ensembles and alternative uh, concert formats and so on. I'm, I'm excited to see that. I think that's really, really healthy. Um, there's still always going to be a place for great symphonic literature and performances. Um, that That isn't going to go away. It just might be and nobody really knows what, what's going to be like coming out of this, this pandemic. We really don't know, but it's pretty serious. And, you know, uh, we're, we're going to take a pay cut next week, I think. Um, I don't think we'll be laid off, fortunately. We're very blessed there, but, but we're going we're gonna to have to sacrifice because nobody's going to concerts right now. So, yeah. When you're in your 20s and late teens, you can afford to sacrifice some of the uh, normal things in life. You can afford to have a pundit-like existence for a while. And I say that with all seriousness. Um, you need to be talented. Um, you need to be disciplined. You need to be single-minded. You need to cut out unnecessary distractions. Most of my students are off of uh, Facebook and Instagram, I think, um, you know, those are huge time sucks and, and really pretty worthless uh, pursuits. You know, you can do that. You you can even you can even ignore your health if if you you know you're like exercise. I think exercise is very important, by the way. But you do need to be like you're entering a uh, a religious institution for for several years and really devote yourself to amassing the 10,000 hours that we know is necessary for um, mastery of an, an instrument. And you need to have big ears and a small mouth. You need to really listen. Um, and you need to take things in and be critical um, in what you're, what you're hearing. What you put into your ears is very important. I have, I have uh, limited success with this, but I'm, I'm actually rather... If you want a symphonic career, I'm rather militant about not listening to other kinds of music for a while. Because every day, every day we get farther away from Mozart, every day we get farther away in years from the style of, of uh, Bach. I mean, we, we really do. And we're guardians of a great tradition and we need to, you know, we need to be exemplars of that tradition, whatever it means for today's world. Now, that's a different thing from actually somehow conjuring up what it was like in the 18th century in Leipzig. We'll never know. But uh, we also do need to immerse ourselves in the sounds from that time period as best we can, to the best of our knowledge, and be able to represent that in a, in a fashion that's recognizable by other people. And I think it, it does pollute your ears to have other musics going in your ears um, uh, you know, in a big way. I mean, you really, really need to. I remember in, uh, in school, actually, we had a music history teacher who um, 
she had interesting um, priorities. She she loved Haydn, but didn't particularly care for Mozart. And so we listened to a lot of Haydn. Like for two weeks, we listened to nothing but Haydn. And then we went to um, Beethoven's Eroica, and it was like a total world-changing experience. And I think there's there's people in our field who really don't see a big difference between the Eroica Symphony and the Haydn Symphony, for instance. And I think that understanding those those, those, those nuances is really important for how you play. Um, you know, a Beethoven Sforzando is very different from a Mozart Sforzando, for instance. That would be an example. Anyway, that that's my sort of militant soapbox lecture about what you ought to be listening to. Um, you can listen to anything you want after you get a job or after you're, you know, established. That's fine. But the develop, I, 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 I think what you put in your ears when you're 17 and 18, 21, 22 is extremely influential and stays with you forever. Now, there's recordings I, I listened to back then that I still go back to um, that really shaped how I sound on the bassoon. And I'm not talking about bassoon players. I'm talking about singers and pianists and so on. So what you put in your ears is really important. Barry, thank you so much for so generously donating your time and joining us on Double Read Dish. We feel so happy and lucky to be able to talk to you. Oh, it's my pleasure. Great talking with you both. We hope you enjoyed that interview. Please don't forget to follow us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And you can listen to us anywhere that you get your podcasts. And we always love to hear from you guys. Go ahead and drop us an email at doublereaddish at gmail.com. Galit, who's coming up on the next episode? Ooh, we're excited about this one. We are talking to Jonathan Kelly, Principal Oboe with the Berlin Philharmonic. Jackie, Time to end this nerd parade. Go make reads.